Did limestone form before life evolved on Earth? That is exactly the question that I aim to answer in this video. If you don't know, modern calcium carbonate minerals like limestone or dolostone form via sedimentation and lithification of calcified organisms like skeletons, shells, tests, etc. Organisms make their hard parts out of calcium carbonate, and then their accumulation at the bottom of the seafloor ends up forming rocks called limestone, right? Not necessarily. Limestone does form this way, and especially on modern Earth and ever since these types of animals evolved, but calcium carbonate minerals and the rocks that result can form without the need for life's assistance, in other words, abiotically. Carbonates form abiotically or precipitate from water if the water is oversaturated in the ions that make up calcium carbonate, in other words, calcium and carbonate ions. This abiotic formation of calcium carbonate can occur in evaporite deposits where water is in a dry environment and evaporates and leaves behind really super saturated water that eventually precipitates out all of its carbonates and other salts. And it can also form abiotically in ooid forming beaches. Ooids are calcium carbonate coated grains that are very smooth and beautiful, almost look like pearls, but they form completely abiogenically. They don't involve life. It's just that these grains roll around on a really warm and shallow beach and as they roll around with the waves moving them back and forth, they become coated in calcium carbonate because that warm, shallow water is already very saturated with calcium and carbonate ions. So back to the question at hand, are there carbonate deposits from before life evolved on Earth, before around 3.5-ish billion years ago? The short answer is no. But does that mean that life is required for carbonate formation? Well, again, like I mentioned on the last slide, no, not technically. Ancient carbonate deposits exist in the rock record from after stromatolites had evolved around 3.5 billion years ago. But even so, it's not necessarily that stromatolites were required for Precambrian carbonate deposition or pre-500 million year ago carbonate deposition. Most Precambrian carbonates, in fact, were either formed abiotically or microbially, so both ways. So is it that prebiotic or before life evolved on Earth, carbonates formed but just weren't preserved? Again, not necessarily. Although carbonate formation does not require life, it likely did require what life caused. In other words, the cyanobacteria that formed the stromatolites, the microbial mats, these were photosynthesizing organisms, and they caused the first real buildup of molecular oxygen in Earth's atmospheres and oceans. And that kicked off the oxidative continental weathering, or the weathering of continental rocks by oxidation, which provided the essential calcium and carbonate ions that eventually saturated ocean water enough to then allow precipitation or formation of carbonate, calcium carbonate, from that water. So what kinds of microbial and abiotic carbonates and limestones were forming in the Precambrian before around 500 million years ago when animals began to evolve and proliferate? Well, we'll start with stromatolites. Like I mentioned earlier, stromatolites are microbial mats, and these cyanobacteria and the other microbes in these mats trap and bind grains, sediment grains, including carbonate grains, into their mats and incorporate them. And they also create conditions favorable for carbonate precipitation directly from the water in situ in the microbial mat. This is because they increase the ambient pH and an increase in alkalinity or increase in pH induces carbonate precipitation. So in other words, carbonate grains are not only incorporated into stromatolite structures, but also cemented together eventually by in-situ precipitated carbonate that precipitates directly from the water in between those grains. Stromatolites in the Precambrian came in a range of shapes, depending on the microbial communities that were in the mat, as well as the environment. The most commonly known mushroom-like shape is seen in mats because they have grown upward in an environment where waves erode their base. On modern Earth, of course, stromatolites are way less diverse and abundant because 
there are many other organisms that kind of take up the environments that they used to live in in the Precambrian, uh, because in the Precambrian, they pretty much had the world to themselves. So uh, they were way more diverse and abundant back then. The next type of carbon deposit we'll talk about from the Precambrian is carbonate grains, which existed and exist from the Precambrian and the Phanerozoic, which is just eon that we're in right now, anywhere from 500 million years ago to today, or 542 million years ago to today, is the Phanerozoic eon, and the Precambrian is everything before that. And Precambrian carbonate grains were much less diverse than Phanerozoic ones. They included intraclass, ooids, pezoids, and peloids. And I'll talk about each of these in the coming slides, so don't worry if you don't know what those are. And the other main difference between Precambrian and Phanerozoic carbonate grains is that they were mostly abiotic, and those in the Phanerozoic are mostly biogenic or produced by biology. So first of these types of carbonate grains is ooids and pezoids. In general, these are formed by accretion of carbonate material, calcium carbonate, around an initial grain of whatever uh, as it rolls back and forth in a shallow warm beach environment, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. But Precambrian ooids and pezoids were much larger than Phanerozoic ones. Now, I should mention that ooids and pezoids the really only difference between the two is ooids are small and pezoids are the same thing but larger. There's a size there that defines one versus the other, but I've seen it defined as different values. So just know that ooids are the small ones and pezoids are the large ones, but sometimes they're used interchangeably. Now, in terms of why they were larger in the Precambrian than nowadays or in the Phanerozoic, well, we aren't really sure why that is. Some suggested that there was greater wave and tidal influence because the moon was closer back then. It's been steadily moving away from Earth uh, ever since the moon forming impact. But um, there are still competing ideas about why these ooids and pezoids were larger. The next type of carbonate grain is intraclasts. In general, these are just fragments derived from erosion of nearby sediment and redeposited in the same area. So they're just kind of broken off or eroded from another rock or formation nearby and then redeposited right there. Carbonate intraclasts in the Precambrian were typically stromaclasts, which were broken off of stromatolites nearby and did travel far and then just redeposited right there. And the last type of carbonate grain we mentioned were peloids, which in general are carbonate mud grains of any size, structure, or origin. So they're kind of a, a big bucket of different types of grains that just kind of lack structure, internal structure, because they're just carbonate mud to begin with, or structuralist fine grain carbonate to begin with, or they're replaced by carbonate mud, or what's called microtized. Carbonate mud, another word for it in some classification systems, is micrite. And so when grains are microtized, they are replaced by carbonate mud and they lose their internal structure because, for example, ooids have an internal kind of accretionary structure with internal circles and sometimes are radial in structure because of the way they grow, but they lose this internal structure when they become microtized. And so any grain, any carbonate grain, like bioclast, fossil fragments, interclasts, pellets, ooids, uh, pezoids, whatever, anything that becomes microtized loses its internal structure and just kind of turns into this really fine grain carbonate material that you can't really see the structure of. Precambrian peloids typically formed either microbially or by abiotic aggregation of carbonate mud. Speaking of carbonate mud, how does this form? How does this mud carbonate or micrite form? Well, anywhere from the Mesozoic to recent, which is basically from around 200 million years ago to today, carbonate mud is dominantly produced by calcareous plankton. So it's biologically controlled. Whereas before the Mesozoic and in the Precambrian, it formed mainly abiotically just by precipitation from the water column. And this was sometimes bioinduced, but it wasn't biocontrolled. What does that mean? Well, bioinduction, biologically induced mineralization, means biology might be indirectly inducing carbonate precipitation or formation, but it doesn't directly control it. In other words, stromatolites or the microbes in the stromatolites or microbial mats at the time may have indirectly induced carbonate precipitation by increasing pH, but they didn't form carbonate skeletons that didn't fell to the seafloor and accumulated like calcareous plankton did and do anywhere from the Mesozoic to recent. This characteristically Precambrian way of producing carbonate mud does not really occur anymore. So why did it really only happen then? The general idea is that 
seawater back then in the Precambrian had a higher calcium and carbonate ion saturation state. So they had more of these ions available before skeleton producing life evolved and used it all up. It also potentially had a higher saturation state of these ions for some other reasons that I will mention in later slides, so stick around. But in order to talk about those reasons, I must first mention seafloor precipitates. Seafloor precipitates like carbonate mud in the Precambrian just kind of precipitated abiotically from the seawater. In the Precambrian, they precipitated on the open seafloor. This is unique to the Precambrian. Phanerozoic precipitates that just precipitate from water are restricted to pore spaces in between grains where they form as cements between grains, uh, but they have these nucleation sites, they have the saturation state in this micro environment between grains, but no longer does seawater in general in the open ocean on modern Earth have high enough saturation in calcium and carbonate to abiotically precipitate carbonate. Carbonate C4 precipitates for this reason are much less abundant post GOE or after the great oxidation event around 2.4 ish to 2.1 ish billion years ago. And again, this is likely due to the decrease in seawater carbonate saturation. So, this decrease in seawater carbonate saturation is likely due to the trapping of atmospheric and oceanic carbon into carbonate minerals and rocks on the first supercontinent capable of preserving them long term term as well as decreasing PCO2 or atmospheric CO2 concentrations. During periods of higher atmospheric CO2, you have more acid rain and enhanced continental weathering and therefore an increased seawater carbonate saturation state because you have an increase in the calcium and carbonate flux to the ocean and input into the ocean. The higher CO2 at the time in the Precambrian would have also led to a lower pH, a lower general oceanic pH. However, it was overcome by the increase in carbonate saturation state of the ocean at the time, or at least this is the general thought. So these factors are likely what led to the higher carbonate saturation state of the ocean at the Precambrian and led to the decrease of carbonate saturation state in the ocean from the Phanerozoic onward. The next type of Precambrian carbonate to discuss is cap carbonates, which overlie major glacial episodes and can be up to 20 meters thick. And these form by post-glacial warming that decreases the solubility of carbonates, upwelling of anoxic or oxygen-lacking alkaline deep water, which increased primary productivity, and CO2 buildup during the glaciation and post-glacial weathering spike, which increased solute delivery or calcium and carbonate delivery to the oceans and greatly increased carbonate deposition directly after the glacial period. And the last type of Precambrian carbonate deposits we'll talk about are reefs. Reefs in general are carbonate structures formed by various carbonate producing organisms over time, but Precambrian reefs look very different from modern reefs. Instead of being dominated by corals or sponges or bryozoans or other calcium carbonate producing organisms, they were dominated by stromatolites or basically built fully by stromatolites because that was all that was around. Until around 600 million years ago when the first sponges and Ediacaran fauna began to evolve and build their own reefs. So the answer to did calcium carbonate deposits form before life evolved is no, not in abundance at least. But this was less about life and more about the lack of oxygen to feed the oxidative weathering that then delivered the necessary ions to the ocean. The overall point made by this video is yes, there are many ways that calcium carbonate can form abiotically without life involved at all. But there are also ways that life can either indirectly or directly facilitate carbonate precipitation. And in the Precambrian, there were some pretty cool carbonate deposits, even though there were no sponges, corals, sand dollars, or whatever we have today just yet. So comment below what your favorite Precambrian deposit was, and I will see you guys in the next video.